Whether or not we realize it, buildings shape our lives. In the US, we spend close to 90% of our time indoors, and that means how we move, how we work, even how we feel, is driven by design. But thanks to new technologies, our relationship to the built environment is about to change. And this requires new ways of thinking about how humans and buildings interact. The field of human-building interaction um, suggests the science surrounding how humans uh, perceive and adapt to artificial environments. Technology-mediated approaches to basically understand but also rationalize and improve how we interface with buildings. Understanding that relationship and how that relationship affects human users as well as building performance. Human-building interaction is new, but paradigm shifts like this have happened before. At the turn of the 20th century, the technologies of the first machine age brought about massive changes in infrastructure and architecture. Cities designed around horses and pedestrians were transformed to accommodate cars and factories. These developments turned cities into economic powerhouses, but they also prompted a backlash. Critics argued that despite sweeping advances in artistry and engineering, human beings were being left behind. As journalist Jane Jacobs wrote, there is no logic that can be superimposed on the city. People make it, and it is to them, not buildings, that we must fit our plans. Now, as digital technologies usher in a second machine age, we have the chance to learn from our mistakes. The problem is one of complexity. A complex system has uh, emergent properties, and so uh, things like the weather is a complex system. And humans are a complex system too. It's hard to predict exactly what a human is going to do. So a building is really sandwiched between these two complex systems, the weather on the outside and humans on the inside. This inherent complexity is why approaches based on intuition and rules of thumb leave occupants dissatisfied. But thanks to advancements in sensing and machine learning, buildings may be able to dynamically interact with occupants in an ongoing way. We now uh, have the ability to collect data like never before. In buildings today, what we find is that the humans are constantly adapting to what the building is all, all about. And with capabilities such as uh, human behavior modeling, machine learning and such, building is completely capable of uh, learning from the human and adapting to the needs of the human. To learn more about how to design for this relationship, architects and engineers are turning to human-computer interaction, a field that combines psychology and design with computer science. Human-computer interaction came into being as a field because we started creating computers that people could actually interact with. When there were supercomputers, not many people actually interacted with computers, but when the personal computer or PC came into being, we needed to understand the intersection between psychology and computing. One of the key principles in HCI is human-centered design. Is it going to serve the needs and meet the needs of the user population instead of what's in the engineer's head? So what does human-centered design mean for a building? It starts with the design process. Testing ideas in virtual reality removes some of the guesswork from design by allowing researchers to study how people actually behave in different spaces. Um, you might be wearing a head-mounted display where you're um, then totally immersed in a computer graphics environment. We can use that type of virtual environment to um, create spaces that then can help us study human building interaction. Virtual environments give us the opportunity to, to really explore the edges of this manipulation of perception and adaptation. We can create the layout just as kind of an architect could. But even after construction, building systems can continue to experiment and adapt to human needs. Take heating and air conditioning preferences, what experts call thermal comfort. Instead of buildings where half the people are too hot and half are too cold, temperature can be tailored to the preferences of individual occupants. So the building or the space to know who you are, what your needs are, what your preferences are, uh, what uh, the context is. Human-centered design also means communicating in a fundamentally human way, through stories. I think story and narrative are, are, are just ways that humans are designed to make sense of stuff around them. The buildings are basically, uh, you know, have a story behind them. They have experiences with the human and, uh, and, and they are capable of telling stories. So eventually they can be a source of advice, guidance, 
These technologies may sound like theme park gimmicks or science fiction, but their applications are anything but. So I work at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. One of the things that we're trying to do is figure out how to make the patient experience better. What we found was if we put in new type of lighting, uh, we could actually use that as a, um, as a therapeutic almost. So if a child is having sort of a, a, you know, an episode, then we can say, how about you work on changing the lighting in this room? And that kind of snaps them out of that mode that they were in because they're changing their environment and they have, they have agency over their environment where they don't have agency over very much else in their own lives and their own health. To the engineers and designers working in human building interaction, shelter and aesthetics are just the beginning. Buildings can get to know us, take care of us. I would like people to erase what they think about buildings and what they know of buildings. What are we trying to do for human beings in buildings? What do they need outside of just shelter? Um, and how can we meet those needs? I never saw buildings as lifeless. I always thought they have their personalities and they have uh, their goals and that's what we're trying to do, give them a life, bring them to life.